husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. There are two different worlds, just 22 minutes from each other in Texas. Mansfield and Everman. One for the haves, the other for the have-nots. One described as a country club neighborhood and the other as a trailer park community. When two teens from these different worlds cross paths at an IHOP, their fates end up the same, behind bars for murder. But before we get to that, let's learn a little more about the family from the affluent neighborhood in Mansfield. Rick and Susie Walmsley met while in high school. They both went on to attend college. Rick attended Oklahoma State University and Susie went to Oklahoma Christian College to study art. But two years after graduating high school in 1978, they became pregnant and married. Their first child, Sarah, was born seven months after the ceremony on February 14, 1979. And their second child, Andrew, came along on July 7, 1984. They were very focused on family. Rick worked out of his home office as a CPA and took pride in the yard, while Susie had previously leased a booth in an antique shop for a while, but gave it up to spend time at home. She was very involved in her daughter's cheerleading activities and also enjoyed fishing with her son. You may have heard the phrase, you get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. Well, this was not the parenting tactic Susie used. She would make separate meals if one family member didn't like what was offered that night. A neighbor and friend, Patty Clark, said, Susie was a perfect homemaker. She made sure Andrew's favorite brownies were always on hand and ordered pizza for his friends when they came over to play video games. The Walmsleys, Clarks, and another couple, the Legs, were close friends who normally shared the holidays together. On December 9th, Mickey Legs stopped by to see Susie and look at her beautiful Christmas tree. While there, she saw Rick in the yard putting up the finishing touches on the outside Christmas lights. They were in great spirits that night, Legs said. The woman talked about when the three couples would get together for their traditional holiday party to exchange gifts. On December 11th, Patty Clark arrived home around 9 p.m. and was surprised to see that the Walmsley's Christmas lights weren't on yet and assumed that they had just gone out for the evening. Clark was still up in the early morning hours of the next day when outside she heard squad cars. When she went out to investigate, the officers told her Rick and Susie Walmsley had been found dead. Andrew Walmsley had a strained relationship with his parents, mostly butting heads with his father. Friends of Andrew described him as impulsive and immature, giving examples such as, once being out to dinner for his father's birthday, Andrew threw a bowl of queso dip across the room after his father refused to order an extra one. And one time, a friend was at their house and witnessed Rick insisting that Andrew give him an overdue video so that he could return it to the store. Andrew refused to stop watching, even though Rick promised to rent the movie again. Furious, Andrew threw the video at his father, hitting him in the head hard enough to draw blood. One confrontation was serious enough to result in police visiting their house on a domestic disturbance call, but no arrests were made. Andrew and his sister Sarah also fought constantly. Andrew said that he hated his sister. He said Sarah had once slammed his head into a water heater. Sarah also had a strained relationship with her parents, who were rumored to be very strict and not very trusting of outsiders. One of Sarah's former boyfriends stated, both kids believed that people were only nice to them for their own reasons. Sarah was sent to a psychiatric facility for the first time when she was 16, admitted to Millwood because her parents said she was rebellious. 
She would later be diagnosed as bipolar. In March of 1997, her parents were so frustrated by her constant rebellion, they kicked her out of the house and threw all her belongings out on the front lawn. This only weeks before she was to graduate from high school. Sarah moved in with a guy, Todd Cleveland, whom she had met at a party and had only been dating briefly. They ended up having a daughter together in January 1999, but they eventually split up. At that time, Sarah felt unable to care for her child, so she gave up custody to Todd, but retained visitation rights. In 2001, Sarah filed a lawsuit to regain custody of her daughter. That custody case became very heated and long-winded. Sarah also struggled with alcohol abuse, and on March 29, 2002, she got arrested for a DWI after plowing her car into a fence and trying to flee from police. She ended up pleading no contest to the charges. She worked as a teller at a finance company, where she repeatedly told co-workers she was going to hurt herself. She followed through once while at work and swallowed a handful of antidepressants, but was taken to the hospital in time to have her stomach pumped. Court records show a psychiatrist noted that Sarah suffered from depression and cited possible emotional abuse by mother and minimal support from family. Later, when Sarah was questioned on the matter, she only made a statement saying that the allegations of abuse by her mother were absolutely false. Instead of being at home with his family, Andrew spent his time at an IHOP in Arlington, Texas, which is basically a midpoint between the two worlds, which I had mentioned above. There was a game called Yu-Gi-Oh, which is a Japanese trading card game that Andrew and his friends enjoyed playing. They met at that IHOP and played for hours. In late 2002, high school senior Chelsea Richardson decided to tag along with her brother to one of these games, and that is when the two worlds collided. Andrew and Chelsea started dating after that. Chelsea grew up in a small, rundown tract home with her parents and brother. Her father sadly passed away in 1999, and her mother was barely around as she had to work several jobs just to make ends meet. Ruth and Ray Brustrom were family friends with the Richardsons, whom they had known Chelsea since she was nine. Ray had taken over the father role to the Richardson siblings after their dad died. But tragically, Ray passed away in August of 2002. Chelsea had now lost two father figures, and just a few months later is when she got together with Andrew. Ruth Brestrom, 37, looked remarkably like Andrew's mother. Same smile, same freckles, and the same curly red hair. Andrew seemed like a real sweet kid, Brestrom said. The best guy she'd brought out here. He seemed real honest. Ruth got to know Andrew when him and Chelsea started hanging out at her mobile home which had a small pond on the backside of the five-acre property. Although it had plywood walls and floors in some rooms and no air conditioning, it also had a laid-back atmosphere that Andrew preferred over his own home filled with tension. Andrew had been attending Tarrant County College, but he had often skipped his classes, and by the fall of 2003, he had dropped out. His parents then cut him off financially, so he was virtually living at the Richardson house with Chelsea, which was later described as filthy with roaches crawling on the ceiling. Chelsea's friend, Susanna Toledano, also moved in with the Richardsons after a conflict with her own mother. She and Chelsea had been buddies for several years. The two had even taken out a page in the Everman High School 2003 senior yearbook with photos of them cartoon drawings of saucy females, and the mottos, naughty and nice, smile now, cry later, and up to no good. Chelsea also wrote a poem that was featured on the page titled, Friends Are Forever, which reads as follows. Who holds my hand in tragedy and stick up in a fallacy? Morals, value, strength, courage, and sticking to you, that's what my friends see. 
When Susanna occasionally came to Ruth Burstrom's home with Chelsea and Andrew, she witnessed Susanna as having very low self-esteem, stating, Chelsea could tell her what to do. Andrew and Chelsea were spending lots of time at the Arlington IHOP, often joined by Susanna. The staff knew that when these three showed up, they would take up a large booth for hours, battling Yu-Gi-Oh cards and complaining. The IHOP manager, Hilaro Cardanas, ended up connecting with the teens and soon began frequenting their table, talking with the teens about everything from Yu-Gi-Oh tactics to tropical fish. He was married with a four-year-old daughter. After a while, these fun hangout sessions took a very dark turn with talks of getting rid of Andrew's family. The conspiracy started with methods of murder that required a minimal amount of personal involvement, like staging a robbery where the Walmsleys were killed, putting balloons filled with caustic chemicals in the gas tank of the Walmsley's vehicle, presumably to cause an explosion and cutting the vehicle's brake lines to cause an accident. Andrew also intended on killing his sister, as well as his parents, so he wouldn't have to split the money. Andrew became frustrated when their sabotage plans failed and asked Carnadas to get them a gun. He agreed to try. And just before Halloween of 2003, Carnadas bought a gun off the street and sold it to Andrew for $200. They then tried to persuade him to shoot Rick and Susie, but Cardenas started to pull back from the group. He kept coming up with excuses that he had to work. Chelsea and Andrew stopped coming to the IHOP soon after that and no longer called Cardenas. On Sunday, November 9th, at about 2.30 p.m., Rick Walmsley was driving north on Interstate 35, taking Susie and Sarah to a late lunch at Chili's in Burleson. When he was exiting the freeway, it felt like something slammed into the car, and they heard a loud thud. When they got to the restaurant parking lot, the Walmsleys found a bullet hole in the left rear panel of their Jeep Laredo. They called and filed a report with the police, where Rick told a detective that he remembered a white Mustang like Andrews passing by them shortly before he heard the noise, but that other cars had also passed. Police found no witnesses and made no arrests. It seemed to be a random drive-by shooting. But it wasn't. Andrew, Chelsea, and Susanna were all in that white Mustang, and they did try to shoot the gas tank in the Walmsley's car in hopes it would blow up like they had seen on TV. Andrew was really upset Susanna had missed and made her do target practice. One day in mid-November, Andrew called Ruth, and said Susanna had wanted to do some target practice. Ruth agreed, but insisted the teenagers shoot into the pond so stray bullets wouldn't hurt her neighbors. The teenagers even ranked their shooting skills. Andrew was the best, then Susanna, and Chelsea came in last. After some practice, they finally felt ready to go through with their next plan. In the early morning hours of December 11th, 2003, Andrew Chelsea and Susanna used a garage door opener to enter the dark house where they found Susie asleep on the couch covered with a blanket. Susanna shot Susie in the head at close range. The bullet pierced her left ear, killing her instantly. The police later stated she never knew what happened. Then Susanna ran toward the master bedroom where Rick was asleep and began firing. But when he had heard the gunshot in the living room, he had jumped out of bed, making her miss twice. Rick charged toward her as she shot him again, this time hitting him in the right temple. Rick forced Susanna into the living room where he fell on top of her, causing her to drop the gun. This is where Andrew and Chelsea were forced to intervene. Andrew tried to get his father off of Susanna while Chelsea picked up the gun and shot Rick in the back. As the three now stood over Rick, he tried to ask his son, why? But Chelsea started stabbing him with a kitchen knife, and Susanna joined in by stabbing him in the back. Rick eventually collapsed in the front entryway after being stabbed more than 21 times. After this, 
the three went back to Susie's body and stabbed her at least 18 times to make sure she was dead. Then they left to wait for someone to find the bodies. However, after the whole day had passed with no one noticing, Andrew got impatient and went back to his parents' house around 11.40 p.m., dialed 911, said nothing, and left. It was believed to be Andrew according to fingerprints found on the phone. He was ready for his payday. When Mansfield police arrived at 11.44 p.m., they knocked on the front door but got no response. Officers found the garage door open, and the door leading from the garage into the house was also open. They went inside and found the horrible scene. There was nothing missing and no forced entry, but they did find a clump of hair and Rick's clenched fist. They were believed to have been dead 8 to 12 hours before being found. Andrew and Chelsea came by the house at about 8.30 a.m. on December 12th, telling police they'd learned of the murder investigation on television. They voluntarily went to the police station, where they stated that December 9th was the last time they had seen Rick and Susie. That day, they had asked the Walmsleys permission to go on a camping trip. Permission was given, but cold weather prompted them to stay at Chelsea's house instead, and the couple described a night filled with a movie, putt-putt golf, then visiting a friend. But they had no alibi for the estimated time of the murder. Andrew also allowed a search of his car, but then withdrew his consent, leading police to impound the Mustang. In the car, the police found evidence that a large amount of human blood had once been on the seats, but the seats had been thoroughly cleaned and couldn't be identified further. The news of the Walmsley's murder bewildered the entire Walnut Estates community. Had they surprised a burglar looking for Christmas loot? Was a maniac on the loose in their little area? Where would he strike next? Free-floating paranoia reigned throughout the holiday season, and the police gave little information to squash these worries, other than saying they believed it was an isolated incident. A rumor began circulating in the neighborhood that the Walmsleys were in the Federal Witness Protection Program and the murders were professional hits. Early on in the investigation, police considered Todd Cleveland a person of interest because of the bitter custody dispute he had with Sarah, in which Rick and Susie were increasingly playing a financial role. Sarah also suspected Todd in this attack and also in the drive-by shooting a few months earlier. She thought the Jeep shooting was in retaliation of her filing a CPS report on him, stating she suspected her daughter had been harmed or endangered in some way while in his care. Cleveland, however, passed a polygraph test and was soon cleared. The Walmsley children were also under suspicion because they had the most to gain. More than $100,000 in cash and a $1 million life insurance payoff to be split between the two siblings. Both Sarah and Andrew agreed to take polygraph tests. Sarah passed, but Andrew failed. And from that point on, Chelsea and Andrew refused to cooperate and wouldn't provide DNA samples. In January, police issued subpoenas compelling eight people, which included Andrew, Sarah, Chelsea, and Susanna, to submit DNA evidence. The only reason Susanna was included was for being Chelsea's roommate and her and Chelsea both had dyed hair. This was important as it was strands of dyed hair that were found in Rick's hand. It turned out Susanna's DNA test would be the most important piece of evidence and ripped this case wide open. While waiting for the results, Sarah filed a lawsuit in early March of 2004, trying to block her brother from collecting their father's life insurance or other funds alleging that he was the principal or an accomplice in willfully bringing about the death of Rick Walmsley. The judge granted Sarah's request for a temporary restraining order against her brother. The DNA test finally came back on March 30th. The hair found in Rick's hand matched Susanna's. She had seemingly disappeared, but was later tracked down to a relative's house in Addison, Illinois, 
Susanna Toledando, was arrested on April 4th. In her statement to police, she only implicated Hilario Cardenas, who wasn't even on the police's radar. He is the one that implicated Andrew and Chelsea, and they were arrested on April 7th. On May 9th, FBI agents, Texas Rangers, Mansfield police, and firefighters from four different departments went searching on Ruth Burstrom's five-acre property. They drained the pond and found bullets that would later be matched to those from the Walmsley's killings and the drive-by shooting. Susanna Toledondo pled guilty to murder in January 2005 to avoid the death penalty. On May 26, 2006, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. As part of her plea deal, she testified against Chelsea and Andrew at their subsequent trials. She will be eligible for parole in 2034. Hilario Cardenadas pled guilty to conspiracy to commit murder. He received a 50-year sentence on May 26, 2006, and was eligible for parole in 2014, but was denied, and has been denied two more times. If he continues to be denied parole, his scheduled release will be in 2056. Chelsea Richardson's trial began in May of 2005. Chelsea's fellow prison inmates testified at her trial that she had admitted to her role in the murders. Susanna also testified that Chelsea told her to kill the Walmsleys so they could share the family's estate. After only three hours of deliberation, Chelsea was convicted of capital murder. The jury deliberated for just more than two hours before unanimously sentencing Chelsea to lethal injection on account of the crime's brutal and premeditated nature and that she was considered a danger to society. She became the first female sentenced to death in Tarrant County, Texas. Later, after a successful appeal in 2012, her sentence was commuted to life and she must serve 40 years before being eligible for parole, which will be in 2045. Andrew Walmsley went to trial in 2006 and was convicted of capital murder on March 5, 2006. However, jurors did not view Andrew as a future danger to society and sentenced him to life in prison. Upon hearing this sentence, Sarah Walmsley ran sobbing from the courtroom. She knew Andrew would have killed her also if she had been in the house that night and feared what he might do to her from jail. He will be eligible for parole in 2044. The act of killing one's parents is called parasite. It was once referred to as the schizophrenic crime, but changed because it is now recognized as being more complex. In a study done from 1976 to 1998, parasites accounted for 2% of all homicides, but the scandalous nature of these crimes has fascinated the public. Taken from an article in MD Edge, it describes examples of parasite throughout history and pop culture, such as, in ancient times, the Roman emperor Nero was responsible for the death of his mother, Agrippina. In 1892, Lizzie Borden attracted national attention and inspired a children's song about 40 wax when she was suspected but acquitted of murdering her father and stepmother. Charles Whitman, infamous for his 1966 killing spree from the University of Texas at Austin Tower, killed his mother before his rampage. And in 1993, the trial of the Menendez brothers, who were eventually convicted of murdering their parents, was broadcast on court TV. Parasite also plays a role in literature and popular culture. Oedipus would have never been able to marry his mother had he not first killed his father. In the movie Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock told the story of Norman Bates, a hotel owner who killed his mother and preserved her body in the basement. In the novel Carrie, Stephen King uses matricide as a means to sever the relationship between the main character and her domineering mother. And in 1989, the band Aerosmith released a song, Janie's Got a Gun, about a girl who kills her father after he sexually abused her. 
men who specifically commit matricide, the killing of their mother, had a schizophrenic diagnosis, were single and lived with their mothers before killing them, and many of the perpetrators' fathers were absent. Men who normally commit patricide, the killing of their father, had fathers who were noted to be domineering and aggressive, and their relationships with their sons were cruel and unusual. And following the acts, the sons described feeling relief rather than remorse or guilt, leading to a feeling of freedom from the abnormal relationship. In a study of 5,488 cases of parasite, 4,738 of those cases were committed by sons. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstuart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it.